Alvin worked as executive in Salesforce, Facebook, Google, and multiple other tech firms. He has a unique insider's view into the recruitment process and is now the founder of Kadima Careers. It is actually a two-year-old startup that is on a mission to accelerate 1 million career by next 20 years, that is 2040. They are based in Brooklyn, but they serve anyone in the world, actually anyone who wants to accelerate their careers. So I hope I pronounced Kadima. It's like Kadima. Yep. Yep. Kadima is correct, correct pronunciation. Okay. But I was pretty nervous. <laughs> Thank you for that. Aaron. So yeah, let's start. Best of luck and the floor is all. Great. And, and folks can see my slide where it says why tech recruiting is biased. Can, can people see my uh, slides? Yep, we can see those. Okay. Uh, Divya, Jami, yeah, both. Yeah. Okay. So one thing just to correct you um, is I was not a recruiter at these companies. So I worked closely with the recruiting team, but I was a hiring manager. And there's differences between the hiring manager and the recruiter. So I, I've hired Bye -bye. people in customer support, operations, customer success, uh, sales operations, and so forth. So not, not a big deal, just clarifying that. Okay. So here's a little bit about my background. So I have a 28-year career. I started in, in going for a career in psychology. I got into a PhD program in psychology realized I did not want to spend the full seven years to get my PhD. I pivoted to Wall Street. I worked in equity research and then venture capital. I wanted to become, um, I was big into sports, big into sports analytics. I pivoted my career into working in baseball. I worked for the New York Mets and the Toronto Blue Jays minor league affiliates. After that, decided to go back to business school so that I can reinvent myself for my fourth career. And there I became a marketer at American Express, working for six years, leading customer acquisition, like sales, partnerships, biz dev, and retention and loyalty. I liked Amex, but realized that the pay wasn't that great and wanted to get into a top tech company. After getting rejected five times from Google, finally got someone to talk to me. And 11 interviews later, I got hired by Google. I was at Google for six years, left there, worked at a couple of different startups, uh, realized that the pay is better at the big tech companies, the work-life balance is better at the big tech companies. So I went back to uh, Facebook and then uh, Salesforce. And in July of 2020, I started a side gig called Kadima, where I'm helping people to accelerate their careers, to land more interviews to land more offers and to make more money. And I started that as a side hustle and then left Salesforce in September of 2021 to go all in on my startup. So that's a little bit about my career. That this presentation is about diversity and biases. And you actually see on my, uh, I'm wearing today, my Salesforce shirt where it says, I love equality. Um, People ask me all the time, why do I, as a white dude who has received my share of privilege in my career, care about diversity? So the first picture on the left is a little bit about my upbringing. That is, actually I have it here. That is my grandpa's um, change maker. He was a cab driver, blue collar cab driver in New York City, never went to college and you know, he, he worked damn hard so that um, my mom, his daughter was able to um, have a better life for herself and for us to have a better life for ourselves. And I've just been fortunate. Um, also come from a Jewish background where our people have not always been treated the best, um, obviously the Holocaust and other things like that. So I've just been appreciative of my privilege. And also um, I've been at these companies and you see the first picture is me living the dream at Facebook at Menlo Park. The next picture is me wearing a shirt uh, that says Tableau supports black lives. And while Tableau and other companies talk a big game, there were only one VP out of 40 
BPs are higher at Tableau that were black, two and a half percent. So the numbers didn't, the action did not really match the, the talk. Um, so at these companies, I saw a lot of talk and I didn't see all the action that I was hoping for on the diversity front. Um, I, I posted today on LinkedIn, the companies, Salesforce is a great company and they are trying to do something on the diversity front and they spend a hell of a lot of money on marketing and they've bought the URL equality.com. So if you go to that splashy website, you will see all this fantastic stuff about all these diversity initiatives. And this is not to trash talk Salesforce. They're actually a very progressive company in this, but there's a lot more talk from them than action and for all different companies. So on the same page with uh, where the top of this, the page is this lovely picture of all these diverse Salesforce employees. Then if you scroll down, you see the actual metrics of where they are. So globally, only 36% of Salesforce employees are women. In the US, it's a little bit higher. In the US, only 5.3% Hispanic or Latinx, and only 4.8% Black. And I'll show you on the next slide what the representation should be. So not just to say about Salesforce, but just some other top tech companies. And these are all stats that you can find in their annual diversity reports. These are the rates of Black um, professionals at these companies. They're all really poor versus the US mix of 13.4%. Latinx, you see 18.5%. Oh, and someone's asking for the website. The website is equality.com. Right there, I just put it in the, the chat window. So you will not see this chart, this um, grid on equality.com, but you will see, um, you will see this on equality.com. And you will see this if you scroll further down the screen on equality.com. But anyway, the numbers are not catching up to where normal representation is. And if you see in the legend, everything in red are underrepresented. So women globally, Latinx in the US, Black in the US are really significantly underrepresented versus what the natural distribution should be. So there's something off here. I've worked at these companies and I've kind of seen what's off. There are a few obstacles. One, the recruiters, the people that are reaching out to you, they have jobs to do. The recruiter at Google, the recruiter at Meta, the recruiter at um, Salesforce, at Microsoft and Netflix, their job is to hire fast and to hire a lot of people. So they don't necessarily care who it is, they just need to hire for speed and volume. And as you think about that, there are three primary ways that candidates get considered in the recruiting funnel. The first one on the far left is roles are posted and candidates submit their resume. That's open to anybody, but you, because that's open to anybody, you have hundreds, if not thousands of competition there. The second bucket in the middle are sourcers. They're called them sourcers, S-U-R-C-E-R, -E not like a sorcerer, not like a magician, but these are people that are sourcing talent. And they are reaching out to talent from doing Boolean searches on LinkedIn. And those Boolean searches are often focused on people that are working at good companies, went to good schools, have good experience. So there's lots of bias in those sort of individuals that have that opportunity. The third bucket where candidates come in for consideration is through referrals. And the referral channel is hugely incentivized like employees get paid to refer people internally. So there's a lot, and also referred employees generally have a higher likelihood of being a good candidate because usually someone within a company can assess if someone is going to be a good fit for that company. But what happens there are white people know a lot more white people. 
Black people know a lot more Black people. Asian people know a lot more Asian people. And if you have a current mix in the organization where it is only uh, 5% Black and only 6% Latinx and only 35% women, where do you think the referrals are going to, um, to, to t trend towards? So those referrals are inherently biased as well. So that's where one of the first biases come into the whole recruiting process. There are ways to overcome this obstacle. Ways to overcome it is to proactively reach out and build your network. So just because I might naturally have more white people in Brooklyn in my network, because that's where I live and that's where I congregate, I can proactively reach out to people that are different than me and I can look at some sort of way to, to build that relationship. So that's one way that you can take it onto yourself, build that relationship and reach out, be proactive there. It's not natural, it may not be, uh, like you may not come as privileged with a strong network, but you can build that. Obstacle number two, interviews overly indexed to white and male in terms of who those interviewers are. If you think about when you interview for jobs, I would imagine that there is very likely that they are predominantly male and they're predominantly white for most jobs. There's data out there and it just happens. And there are either explicit biases because of that or just discomfort when you're not being interviewed by someone that looks like you. There are ways of you as a candidate, if you are not um, looking like that individual, that you can proactively try to influence that, that conversation to build rapport with that interviewer. And I'm not saying just because someone looks differently than you that they are going to be racist or sexist or things of that nature, but there's lots of research out there, lots of information that there is what there are ways to influence people and there are biases that people have. So there are, there are ways that you can find commonalities, reach out and, um, and understand that that bias exists and try to circumvent that. Uh, um, and so, so these books talk a little bit about those biases and why they exist. And then there are ways that you can overcome that bias. Dale Carnegie writes a great book about how to win friends and influence people. And there are ways that you can build rapport with people, even if you do not have similar background with them. Also, there are ways to prepare for interviews. So even if you're not seeing people that look like you, you can ace the interview by preparing effectively. A good book for case-based interviewing is case in point. So you can learn, you can practice, you, you can do a little scouting report of what that interview process is like. And we share lots of information with that at Kadima, and I know Karis does as well. The third obstacle that, that you need to be aware of is that underrepresented professionals, people without a big network, people without a big understanding of what they're worth, don't always know what they're worth. And there's lots of research out there. I, I forget what the numbers are, but I believe women are paid about 81 cents on the dollar. And I think black um, professionals are paid about 61 cents on the dollar. So there are biases in there for lots of reasons. And when I, when I speak to people, I, I speak to lots of clients. And one of my first questions that I ask them is, what sort of compensation are you seeking in your next role? They will usually answer with what they're currently making. And that's not what I ask them, but they're anchoring. They're basing what they think that they should be asking for based on what they're making now. And if you have biases in the system that are paying you less, because you're a woman, because you're a person of color, you are going to think that you you're deserve less and you will ask for less and you will receive less. So a lot of those factors also go into the biases in the system. So after you even get the role, you're not gonna get even paid what other people might get paid for the role. So there's ways to overcome this bias on anchoring and what you're worth. 
There's some data that you can look at at levels.fyi, Blind, uh, Fishbowl has some information there. I know Karis offers negotiation services. Kadima offers that as well. You can just email us at getmorekadimacareers.com and we help you negotiate for more. But there's specific things that you can do to improve your chances of not just succeeding in the interview, but when you get those offers to be getting paid what you are worth. And when you get that offer, that is one of the highest inflection points where you can actually um, uh, push for your, advocate for yourself and get paid what you're worth. Usually when you're in the company, they'll give you a raise of a 3%, 4%, 2% every year. But when you're switching jobs, there's really no cap on how much more or less you can earn. So I'll talk a little bit about, so here's all this information, here are all the biases, and I'll talk a little bit about some other things that you can have in your repertoire to take a proactive approach to your career search that will help you get more leverage than the companies. And what I'm trying to do with Kadima and what I've one of the big reasons I started Kadima was to level the playing field between candidate and company, between employee and employer. So the method that we take at Kadima is what we call the growth framework. And what that stands for is I highly recommend as you're setting out on your career path to first identify your goals. And those goals should be clear they should be formed based on your values and what's important to you. But what the biggest output of that should be is a list of 40 companies that you would be excited to work for. So it could be like Google and Facebook and Netflix, but you can build that out as well with VMware and uh, Vimeo and um, Okta and Twilio. There's lots of great companies out there. And if you're thinking about how to develop that list of 40, you can go to our website. We have a list of the top um, 100 companies that we recommend working for. Then the next part, realistically assess and market your strengths. So I, I speak to a lot of people that are trying to pivot from marketing to sales or from product management to program management or from program management to product management. Don't do that. Leverage your strengths, get your foot in the door, market yourself for that. It will improve your likelihood of being selected. It will improve your ability to interview for the role because you know what the hell you're doing. And when you join that company, you will know what you're doing. You'll, you'll get off on a better foot and you can always move internally once you get there. So realistically assess your strengths and market your strengths. Next, this one is probably the most critical piece, outreach. And this is how you can overcome some of those biases that are inherently occur in a, the network effect of white people knowing white people and wealthy people knowing wealthy people. But you can, if you know the companies that you're aiming for, you can start to look for people at those companies and you reach out in a authentic and humble and polite manner and you can build relationships. And it's not about asking for a job right then, it's really about building long-term relationships. The next part of the growth model is work the system. So once you know the companies you want to work for, you should be looking at those company websites once a week. When you see a good role that's a good fit for you, you should either get your application in right away or better yet, leverage your referrals and you'll get more and more referrals if you take a proactive approach to outreach. Fifth is train and have tenacity for interviews. Interviews suck. The process sucks. Last time I was interviewing for a job, I applied for 300 jobs. I got interviewed for 47 of them. I got five offers. But what that means, if I got five offers, I got rejected 295 times out of those applications. It sucks. Sometimes I got rejected because I deserve to, and sometimes I got rejected because they had a strong internal candidate or whatever. But you can get rejected for any reason, but you need to, continue, you need to prepare for those interviews so you do your best but you also have to have tenacity because you will get rejected. It comes with a game, unfortunately. At the finals of interviews, when you get to the final round with Netflix or Google or Salesforce, 
even though you think you're kicking ass at that point, there are three or four other candidates that are at that stage as well. So even at that stage, you only have a one out of three to one out of five shot of getting that role. So you are going to get rejected more than you're going to get the role. And then the last part, again, this goes to a lot of the biases and the compensation. Once you get that offer, then you should take part in high impact negotiation. And if you attack this in a polite way, in a, a place of knowledge, a place of information, you will be able to get more money. You will get paid what you deserve. So it's easy. And, and then with that, you launch your career with that very nice animation. So totally bad segue here. So the growth model essentially is what we've built with our KJAM course, which is called Academia. Oh, actually, <laughs> sorry. It's the, the, the job acquisition method. That's why it's called KJAM, a missing job there. But what this is, is we basically boil down the growth framework and we have given you templates. We have given you resume templates. We have given you um, scripts to use. We have given you access to real recorded interviews that I conducted when I was interviewing at Salesforce, at DocuSign, at Adobe, at Stripe, at other companies. You can hear how I interviewed at those companies. Um, people get introductions to my network as well for those that take and follow the course and you get discounts off of our negotiation services. So as part of um, appreciating my partnership with Karis and um, I, I'm offering everybody with Karis $100 off the course. It expires at the end of this month. If you go to kadimacareers.com slash Karis, you will uh, be able to get $100 off our course. So um, I encourage you to check that out. And it comes with a 30-day money-back guarantee as well. Although no one has asked for their money back, but it, we do offer that. Um, let's see. So that's what I, oh, so the couple other things that I, the, the one last thing. So whether you want the course or not, a key aspect of the growth format on the goal side is identifying those 40 target companies. So what we have on our website, I referred to before, and you can scan the QR code or you can go to kademacareers.com slash top 100. You will see our list of the top 100 companies that we recommend that will help accelerate your career, help put you in a good place. Not to say that they are not biased in their hiring and recruiting, but they are companies that at least are talking that they do want to hire diverse populations and they do value diversity. So you can check out that list of top 100 companies. And with that, I think those are all the slides that I have. Thank you, Adam. Uh, that was indeed a session which came from your personal experience. Um, I, I personally loved it. Um, so yeah, it's time for questions. Uh, Divya, Zameel, Vivian, please, uh, you know, you can ask her questions on chat. You can ask her questions on QA section and we'll answer them now. So, uh, Alan. Meanwhile, uh, so it's 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 a lot of uh, luck factors also involved, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's it's a combination of uh, skill and right place at the right time. But a lot of it's the right place, right time, which I guess you can chalk up to luck. There are things that you can do to increase. Um, I didn't come up with this term, but. Uh, someone, I forget who it is, talks about increasing your surface area of luck. So you can improve the chances that you will get lucky. But yes, there is a lot, lot of luck involved. Yeah. So uh, before, like, currently I work in startups, but before working with startups, I was working with MNCs. And I used to see a lot of job positions were open for internal uh, employees. Like they do the internal movement. And then the same job was open for referrals. And then the same job was open for the other candidates on platforms, right? So like yeah. someone has to cross through all the hurdles and then the biases, and then you take a job. Hopefully in startup ecosystem, it's not that much, but um, yeah. Uh, um, I, when I yeah. saw that, it was shocking. Yeah. 
yeah, um, companies have different processes, and sometimes we would we would um, open a role only internally for a couple of weeks first before um, before extending it external. And sometimes yeah. we would post it externally, even though we knew we had a strong internal candidate. So we just had to go through the motions. So you, you never fully know what's going on with uh, every offer, every role that's posted. Makes sense. Yeah. So um, I guess there are no questions. Uh, Divya, Jamil, Vivian, can just say yes or no over the chat if you have any questions or all is good. And if you if you like to share what you learned from the session, anything. Well, okay, perfect. If, um, if so, folks, uh, yeah, if folks don't have any questions, they can um, definitely always reach out to me on LinkedIn. I'll put my uh, my profile on here too. Although I'm sure you can find me. Yep, definitely. Um, thank you, Ellen. Thank you for this enlightening session. And yeah, I'll hope to see you around over the mails, over the conversations. And yeah, have a great day. Thanks a lot. Catch you later. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.